welcome everyone. We we are going to have our presentations uh, on NLP projects. So before going to uh, towards the projects, I would like to uh, welcome you at Omdina School and uh, share uh, thoughts with you. What is Omdina School is about and how you can participate. What op opportunities you can benefit from. So. Please allow me to share my screen. So we have um, Omdina School Initiative that is actually data science education uh, by teaching, uh, you know, quality education with application of area of machine learning and artificial intelligence without any financial or geographical barriers. So it's, it's not only for the learner perspective, obviously you can learn, but for instructor as well. So uh, you can part, you can show your interest by adding sign up as a student or you can uh, be an instructor as well if you want to teach any course uh, and you have a good case study so you can simply sign up as instructor and we'll get back to you so so far we have around so we, we started omdina school back in october uh, 2021 and up till now we have uh, launched almost uh, 12 courses so we, we have various courses like you know identifying diseases in plant with image categorization in edge devices social sector and media use cases of ai data analytics so you can you can open up any course and you can go through the details what are the content in the course what for whom the course is designed how many hours are required how many students will be added what is the profile of instructor so you can go through the content and if uh, you see that is that makes you know al are aligned with whatever the skills that you want to learn you can simply apply for the course and if you you will be selected you will be contacted and uh, you will get chance to uh, take part in the course so it's not just like you know you attend the course and you know you listen uh, the lecture from the instructor it's not like that so we are trying our best to make it more interactive course we are uh, learning it within the session are taken place in the form of quizzes or in in the form of interaction after every session uh, you get uh, assignment home assignment rel relevant to the content and after uh, the completion of the course you you'll get uh, Project. So if you pass everything, like every milestone only, then you will be eligible to uh, get certificate uh, of, of, of the course, right? So uh, similarly, we, we had the current course uh, delivered by Juber. Juber has already shared the course solving business problem with NLP. So the course started from very basic understanding of what is NLP, Go moving forward with you, you can see the, the objective and content of the course, like starting how to scrap the data, uh, textual data sets, how to prepare that, how to visualize that, how to apply machine learning application, so semi supervised, supervised, deep learning, and so on. So today you you are you are going to see how student or learner have. Uh, uh, prepared the projects and uh, after learning the course, right? So I'll I'll not take much of much time of the uh, the students. So I would like to uh, invite Ratika to share his presentation. Ratika, you 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 are here. Yeah, please go ahead. You are muted. Can can you unmute yourself? Okay, uh, am I audible now? Yes, you are. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you, Aram. And uh, hello, everyone. I am Radhika, and I will be giving my uh, presentation on my Omdina School Capstone project. Uh, it is based on real life, uh, real time uh, tweet sentiment analysis. So I will just share my presentation.
Yes. So, uh, so as we all know that uh, this uh, Omjana School course was mainly about uh, how we can use uh, NLP to solve business problems. So, as a capstone project, uh, what I took as my uh, topic or project was to so how uh, businesses. Uh, can actually gauge and analyze the uh, consumer's or customer's sentiment. And uh, by you, you understanding their sentiment and their uh, general mood and uh, uh, expressions uh, regarding their products and services, the, it will benefit uh, the organizations to actually enhance their products and services and their offerings. Not only for uh, business perspective, I think uh, this uh, sentiment analysis can be used in various other domains, such as in political campaigns and various other, uh, we saw recently like uh, in political campaigns, how politicians use it to actually understand and gauge how um, uh, the vo voters will uh, are engaging and which was which side uh, they are more inclined so accordingly they can make changes uh, regarding their political campaigns so this is a, a useful uh, this is a useful tool for all the businesses uh, which will help them in understanding their customers or consumers or the target market so uh, these are the basic overviews of uh, the thing that we need to go through uh, in order to do the sentiment analysis and starting off so in order to uh, ha and, uh, extract, like uh, in order to do the tweet sentiment analysis, the first thing that we need to do is actually get uh, access to the Twitter uh, APIs. Now, whenever uh, we, uh, like Twitter offers powerful APIs uh, using which uh, we, uh, any, uh, we can actually um, uh, do a lot of uh, 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 data mining using their APIs uh, and uh, analyze them. So in order to get uh, Twitter access, we need to first have a Twitter developer account. So for that, we need to have a Twitter account and then apply for it. Uh, they usually um, give access uh, like uh, within a week or two weeks. Uh, they basically ask uh, questions and we need to fill them up. So you can apply here in the link below, as you can see. And once you get the Twitter access, uh, you can uh, just uh, enter in your dashboard. Uh, developer dashboard and there you have to create a one project and twitter app uh, against that twitter app uh, you will receive a uh, consumer uh, the api keys like basically uh, we require four keys uh, in order to um, use the twitter apis uh, so after getting the twitter access uh, we can now uh, extract the tweets so for extracting the tweets uh, uh, what we can do is in python we can use the tweet library which is a very popular library for extracting uh, tweets using Twitter APIs. So uh, Twitter, uh, Twitter library uh, actually gives us a lot of um, flexibility and uh, it is uh, quite easy to use. Uh, if we can use the Twipy cursor. Earlier, uh, Twipy didn't have uh, the cursor format and we had to handle the pagination manually. But now with the latest Twipy version, uh, we can use the cursor to uh, iterate over the tweets. Uh, we can uh, search the tweets based on the hashtags and um, uh, user uh, user Twitter to do Twitter handles, as well as uh, based on any keywords. But uh, there's one catch in this that uh, the whatever free APIs uh, that Twitter has, uh, using that we can only extract tweets for last seven days, uh, that is uh, one week. And if you want, uh, we want to extract tweets, uh, which is um, like older than uh, seven days, then uh, we will require premium Twitter accounts, uh, like um, like uh, using that we can extract tweets uh, for th like beyond 30 days and also uh, using academic research license uh, we can use it for like archive uh, we can also extract archive tweets too so here we have uh, extracted the tweets uh, using the creepy person and stored it in a data frame pandas data frame so uh, whatever information we require uh, we can just store it like here i have stored the date twitter handle uh, likes and uh, user location as well as follower counts. So next, uh, now in every NLP pipeline, um, uh, there is uh, one uh, important uh, task that we all need to do is that uh, we need to process the we process the unstructured uh, text data that we receive. So um, basically, we have certain uh, steps uh, in pre-processing of the. Um, input text that we uh, that we get. Uh, so here our input text is basically the tweets. So um, so in order to uh, pre-process these tweets, uh, we will be first focusing on um, some these uh, four broad 
things like is, uh, we have to remove the Twitter handles of uh, the at user Twitter handles because uh, we don't need that for our Twitter sentiment analysis. Then we will remove uh, everything except text and number and spaces. And uh, we also need to remove the emojis. And apart from that, uh, we also have to remove the HTTP SS uh, links um, and uh, the retweet symbols that are available uh, that are present in the tweets. So how we can do this, we can achieve a uh, pre-processing of tweets by using the regular expression package of Python, uh, which, uh, which uh, gives us, uh, we can use the regular expression format for cleaning the tweets. So after cleaning the tweets, uh, now we can use these clean tweets to get our scores, uh, sentiment scores. So uh, we can use a lot of uh, different packages to get our sentiment scores that are available in Python uh, libraries. Uh, the most popular one being the text blob library. Uh, it is uh, one of the most popular NLP library for uh, extracting sentiment from tweets. So what a text, box, uh, text blob gives us is basically polarity of the tweets as well as subjectivity. Uh, subjectivity is like whether uh, text is uh, like objective, a fact, or a text is very much subjective, that is uh, opinion of a person or a an organization or whatever entity so we can extract the subjectivity of the uh, tweets as well as we can extract the sentiment of the tweets which is the polarity so if uh, we have a polarity value of zero uh, that means that uh, text is neutral having a neutral sentiment and if it is having a polarity greater than zero we consider it as uh, somewhat inclined towards positive uh, the more it is towards uh, plus one the higher uh, degree of positivity in the sentiments of the tweets and the more it is towards the negative minus one uh, the more it is inclined towards the negative sentiment so here uh, we can just write one uh, custom function for analyzing the, analyzing the tweets uh, getting the positive neutral and negative sentiments so now, after uh, analyzing the sentiments that uh, I received from the text blob, uh, there were a lot of like uh, the sentiments were not uh, as much clear. So I moved on towards transformer libraries. Uh, so transformers are very uh, popular, have become very popular in the NLP domain because they give higher uh, accuracy and better um, explanations and analysis when it comes to NLP. So. We have a very popular uh, transformer library uh, presented by Hugging Faith. So using the Hugging Faith transformer pipelines, we can easily construct our um, um, transformer uh, token, uh, tokenizer as well as transformer uh, classifier. So in order to use this Hugging Face library, we can just visit their uh, site and download, uh, use any model. Uh, so what I used was basically a tweet-based uh, tweet-based uh, tweet fine-tuned model, which is bird tweet model uh, by uh, Finite Automa uh, Automata. And um, uh, this is just uh, on their site. Uh, this is a hosted API that uh, you can uh, test. So using that, uh, we can see that this sentiment is giving us, like they are giving, uh, in the output, we are getting like three sentiments that is negative, neutral, and positive. And uh, accordingly, we get the scores for each sentiment. So now uh, what I did was like after getting the sentiments, uh, we can just plot the visualizations and distributions. So um, uh, we extracted the tweet for like a particular hashtag. So currently we have this hashtag which is a share you can watch. And uh, we can see that the summary of sentiment count for the from the text blob library. We can see that uh, the negative sentiment uh, predicted by text blob library is less, like it is like around 150. Uh, this was done for like around 800 tweets and uh, total 800 tweets. And for the uh, that transformer, uh, li uh, transformer library that we used, uh, so for that uh, we get a higher number of uh, negative sentiments like uh, around 250 and also a higher number of neutral sentiments and much lesser number of positive sentiments as compared to the text blob library so we can uh, obviously understand that um, transformer uh, model is giving us much better score as compared to text blob library and uh, then we can see the confidence distribution of the sentiment like uh, with uh, like most of the uh, sentiments have been predicted with higher confidence uh, around uh, 0.9 to 1 range and so we can uh, rely that our uh, sentiments are like uh, 
analyzed in a like in a much more uh, confident manner so they are reliable uh, now uh, for plotting these visualizations i have basically used the popular visual libraries of python which is like cbone matplotlib and plotly so for this uh, i have mainly used like this was done using the cbone library so now um, you can see the distribution how the sentiments are distributed like a majority of the sentiments for this hashtag was neutral and then the negative and a very less amount of tweets had positive sentiment and uh, this this uh, second uh, pie chart was done using the plotly library as you can see the plotly library uh, has uh, one advantage over the seaborn library that is it is gives us interactive charts so uh, we can uh, like move and interact with the chart and uh, modify it as and when requ required uh, when we are uh, like rendering it in the page so next uh, we can see like now uh, i also plotted the time series the timeline uh, of the tweets like uh, uh, during which time uh, what kind of sentiment uh, of tweets was uh, present so we can see like it was extracted in 25th march as we uh, as i said that we can only extract tweets uh, for only seven uh, a week old and not beyond that so um, you can see that how uh, positive tweets are distributed at very less number of count and then followed by uh, negative sentiments and then finally the neutral sentiments uh, these are some of the visualizations uh, like uh, we can extract the hashtags like the most uh, mentioned hashtags uh, for a particular particular hashtag like we search uh, regarding the russia you can war so along with russia you can war what are the other hashtags which are uh, being used in those tweets so we can see that uh, these are the top 5 hashtags uh, that were used in the tweets and these are some of the user mentions like the twitter handles that were mentioned in the tweets so we can see these are some of the uh, twitter handles that were mentioned and now this is the streamlit app dashboard that i built uh, to support uh, to like support my ml app and streamlit is a great platform to build any ml app and you can easily as you can see these are the plotly charts which are interactive here and um, streamlit is just a very extend uh, uh, like a uh, extensible and easy platform to actually see uh, build our ml apps uh, in a very easy manner uh, as you can see like i have here plotted the distribution of likes and uh, we can also see the tweets higher, which tweets got highest number of likes and all those things uh, and uh, i would like to share share that app uh, like for real uh, so i just share my screen so this is uh, the sentiment uh, uh, dashboard that i created so uh, one can set uh, search tweets using the twitter handle like uh, we can get fetch tweets for a particular user uh, like a user as well as using any hashtag or keyword so for this i entered this uh, ipl uh, hashtag uh, which is uh, which was trending currently and uh, number of tweets can that we see your app we see your presentation can you share the app okay oh i share it Okay. Uh, so, is my uh, app visible now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so here, uh, here's a Centrumlit app uh, that I built. So, as you can see, we can use the Twitter handle to search the tweets as well as uh, using hashtag. We have the options. <clears throat> we can enter any uh, hashtag keyword. Uh, so, I, I use this IPL twenty twenty two, which is a cricket Premier League, which has been trending currently. and uh, we uh, if we press the submit button we will fetch sentiments so uh, it takes some time to actually fetch sentiments because um, that model that i use transformer model is like around 500 mp so uh, i will uh, start that uh, at the end but for now i will uh, just show what is the results so these are the results uh, that we can see like we can see that our neutral we are getting maximum number of neutral tweets as well as uh, we are getting uh, some amount of positive tweets and then that's the distributions uh, confidence distribution of the sentiments and uh, we can see that um, uh, maximum tweets are at higher confidence levels and um, 
then we can see the timeline distribution of the tweets like uh, at what point of time what kind of uh, sentiment was the tweet having and uh, what is the distribution of the sentiments uh, based on the time and uh, then we can see the likes like um, here like the distribution of likes uh, this is the violent uh, violent distribution chart and we can see like a uh, which uh, what is the number of uh, outliers that is the likes here are 273 likes are the tweets that we extracted the highest number of likes was the 273 one and accordingly we can see the number of retweets that we have So yeah, so these are the highest number of retweets. Uh, as you can see, the charts are like the highest number of retweets are 26 number of retweets. So then we can also see the top five, uh, any number of top and uh, number of uh, Twitter handles based on the number of tweets uh, that were tweeted. So currently against this, uh, we are seeing against hashtags. So against uh, this hashtag, we had around 216 tweets hence this hashtag 17 tweets and so on and they similarly based on twitter handle we can see uh, which twitter handles are posted highest number of tweets so these are some of the twitter handles which posted like highest number of tweets and here we can see some random tweets and uh, tweets based on the sentiment so here we are seeing some uh, negative sentiment tweets and uh, then we can also see some neutral sentiment so uh, these all are accordingly uh, we can see some uh, we can see the word cloud which helps us to understand like uh, what are the words which are actually constituting the uh, positive sentiment or negative sentiment and uh, as accordingly uh, we can understand like uh, which aspect of uh, uh, is uh, going wrong or what is going wrong uh, so here we have fetched for neutral sentiment so i just uh, show it in a full screen mode so these are some of the words that were associated with the neutral sentiment. As we can see that IPL 2022, the hashtag itself has the majority space in this word cloud. So similarly, we can see some negative uh, sentiment uh, word clouds. So these are some negative sentiment tweets. These are some of the uh, word cloud for the negative sentiments. These are the words associated pain, weak, uh, pain, hard. All these are the words weak. So all these words are associated with negative sentiments. So in this way, um, this is how I built my app. So moving back to the presentation. Back to my presentation. Yes. So concluding, uh, we can say that uh, tweet senti uh, sentiments as well as any social media uh, sentiments we can analyze and it will provide uh, businesses, uh, consumers, organizations a, a very insightful uh, uh, regarding their, uh, regarding their uh, businesses and the products that they are uh, providing and it can help them in the long run to actually modify and enhance their products. Uh, further work that can be done in the sciences is that we can do aspect-based uh, sentiment analysis, wherein uh, every aspect such as uh, products uh, features, based on product features or uh, service features, uh, we can get a uh, sentiment for each and every aspect of a product or service. So these are some of the works, uh, further works that can be done to actually give much more powerful sentiment analysis. And uh, lastly, I would like to thank Omdena School and uh, Jubail Sir for uh, providing us such an intuitive course and giving us the opportunity on this platform. Thank you. Thank you, Ritika, for amazing presentation and amazing work. So uh, Jubail, would you like to invite next presenter? Yeah, if any question for Ritika, you can address that. You can ask the, 
I mean, attendees, if they have any question for Ritika, if not, then we can move on to the next presentation. Yes, if anyone has uh, any questions, uh, then please feel free to ask. So the next presenter is J Jarson Gerard Cruz. Jarson, please go ahead. Oh, hello, hello. Yeah. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can see you. Okay, cool. Let me just share uh, the screen. Okay. Is my screen visible to you guys? Yeah. Okay, awesome. So, yep. Uh, hi, everyone. I am uh, Jerson Cruz. I am currently an under undergraduate student, uh, and I'm from the Philippines. And today, I'll be presenting my uh, project entitled uh, Extractive and Abstractive Summarization for Long Scientific Documents. So, uh, before I get into the nitty-gritty details of my uh, pipeline, I'd first like to uh, set the context on uh, what actually uh, text summarization is and why it can be uh, useful uh, for us. So uh, let, let's start by answering uh, the, the, with the most basic question of what exactly is uh, text summarization. Uh, in, in the most simplest terms I could give, uh, I think text summarization is the process of producing an abridged version of a text while still retaining its uh, most important information from the original document. So we're technically taking a text and we want to take all the important information out of it and provide it in a more digestible, concise manner. So uh, now the next question that we can ask is, why should we use uh, text summarization? And for that, I have uh, three main uh, reasons. So the first reason being uh, time. Uh, they say that time is of the essence. They, they say that time is gold. And text summarization has the capacity to save the user time because it provides the information in a more digestible way. And it, more, most importantly, it provides important information, which relates to the second point, such that uh, text summarization actually filters out the less pertinent information and directly gives the user the most important points of a document. And if we combine the benefits of time and information, it could lead to the third benefit, namely that of productivity. So in, in a society where information is, is blitzing and we're filled with so, uh, so much information, it's, it's such dense information, decreasing the time it takes to gather all these important bits and pieces of information can actually increase uh, one's productivity uh, levels. So now that we know um, some reasons why text summarization can be useful, let's now proceed to another question. Uh, what kinds of text summarization uh, are there? And to that, uh, based on my research, are there two main types of text summarization? The first being extractive, and the second being uh, abstractive. Uh, extractive text summarization, from the word itself, aims to extract uh, the most important parts of the document. So in extractive text summarization, don't want to alter the document. We don't want to change uh, any content of the document. We just extract the most important uh, words or sentences, and we rearrange them for the user in a more um, digestible manner by order of uh, importance. For abstracting, uh, this is where we, we uh, instruct the model to first understand what the text is about. And after understanding it using uh, advanced uh, NLP techniques, it generates a, a new summary. So in abstractive summarization, um, new words that do not come from the original text uh, may be present. So uh, I would say that abstractive summarization is more of like the human-like way of summarization, where we first read a document, understand its context, its subtext, and then we put it in our own uh, words. So this is a much more uh, difficult um, text summarization than extractive, but both areas have their own pros and cons. So now that we know uh, the types of text summarization, uh, the next question I'd like to answer is, uh, why am I using both techniques? Uh, why can't I just use extractive or why can't I just use uh, abstractive summarization? And the, the, the the first answer I'll give you is, I was just curious. You know, I, I got amazed by um, text summarization techniques and I wanted to know uh, where they can uh, be applied. 
and uh, what kinds of things uh, I could do with them. So this curiosity made me want to pursue both. So that led to the second reason, which is uh, research. So after doing some research, uh, I found about the types of summarization and the applications of text summarization. And I actually found a study that utilized both extractive and extractive and abstracted summarization. And I will be using that study as reference for this project. And finally, um, after doing more research, I found that there are limitations to just using one method over the other. For instance, I found that some uh, abstracting summarization models actually have a set token limit. So it only has uh, a set uh, amount of length that it can take in order to summarize that text. So this is disadvantageous for uh, long text like uh, what I'm using right now, which is a scientific document. Hence, um, I'll, I'll be using both extractive and then abstracted summarization to circumvent this token limit that some abstracted models, specifically the model I'm using, um, has. Okay. So now that we know uh, why I'm using both techniques, um, it's time to summarize what I actually am doing for this capstone project. And in, in, in before that, rather, uh, this is the study I was referring to. It was the study by um, Vladislav Katya and Denis Stepano. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing them right. And in this study, they used a combination of abstractive and extractive approaches for also long scientific text. And in my study, I won't be using uh, models as uh, in-depth as them. I'll just be using what, what, what models I can use uh, more easily. And I'll be using uh, a data set that uh, I gathered. So to summarize my capstone project, I will I will be um, creating an extract an extracted and abstractive text summarization model on 100 long scientific documents, and I will be deploying the created model. So that's my project in a nutshell. And to describe my pipeline, uh, I have six main steps. The first one is selectively gathering 100 long scientific text documents, and I emphasize here selectively for reasons I will be discussing uh, later on. Then the second step is of course, uh, we need to extract the important parts from those long scientific documents, clean them and pre-process them. After doing the cleaning and pre-processing, I first uh, apply extractive summarization on the pro process data, after which I apply abstractive summarization on the extractively summarized data set, plus the abstract and conclusion of the scientific paper, which I will discuss why later. After doing that, after creating a baseline model, I, I now try to uh, optimize the model by uh, asking the, the model, uh, hey model, what's the most optimal number of sentences to summarize per document? Because some documents, um, three sentences can capture their essence. Some documents require five, some may require seven, some may require 10, some may require two. So it's different for every document. And I try to optimize this during the extracting step of the process. And finally, once I have uh, the most optimized model I can get, I deploy the model using a stream list. So now moving on to discussing uh, it step by step. So we first begin with data collection. So I gathered 100 scientific text documents from Yale's uh, scientific article, um, SISOM. And all text documents were in the XML format. Format, And here is why it's important for me to selectively gather uh, data. Because there are, there are some data, as can be seen in this project rejected format, that do not explicitly state that they have an abstract section. For instance, the abstract here is found in the text itself. Whereas in this project accepted format, the abstract section is explicitly stated. And this is an important difference because when it comes to extracting them, um, XML requires extraction by um, section because it's like um, HTML where it, where it has its own section. So it extracts based on section. And if this rejected, if this format with no abstract section, I, I won't be able to extract the abstract ex uh, directly. And I will have to uh, put in more time to create an algorithm that can handle such um, edge cases. So what I decided, given the um, time limit for the capstone project, is that my limited time is better used um, selectively gathering data than figuring out an algorithm to handle all these um, use cases and even uh, edge cases. Hence why I 
chose to selectively gather 100 text documents that follow the specific uh, accepted format. So now that uh, we've done the extraction, I used an algorithm that extracts the abstract full text and conclusion of each of the 100 documents. And here's an extracted uh, snapshot of, of the data frame. So here we have the abstract. Here we have the full scientific text, which includes the abstract and the conclusion. And here we have the conclusion for every 100 documents. Now that we have our data extracted, it's time to uh, perform some pre-processing steps and cleaning steps. But for this project, um, there are only simple steps um, such as emoji cleaning, uh, web links cleaning, and unnecessary spaces removal. Uh, I didn't include uh, more pre-processing pre pre -processing steps such as the removal of punctuation, stop words, and even the, the casing of the letters because uh, I deemed them to be necessary for the text summary. So if I remove punctuation or stop words, then the summary that will be provided also will not have those punctuation and stop words. And this may affect um, the context and the way we, re we read the summary as humans. So that's why I only applied uh, the simplest of um, cleaning and pre-processing steps. So next we move on to extracting summarization. And for this, I performed it only on the full text of the document. So I just performed it here on this um, column. And uh, I used the BERT transformer model from the BERT Extracted Summarizer Library. And specifically, after doing some more research, I actually found that there's a pre-trained cyber model, which was trained on scientific documents. And I thought it was perfect for uh, my use case. So I used um, cyber pre-trained model to perform the extracted summarization. And as I performed the extracted summarization, I used the method get optimal sentences in order to determine what's the optimal number of sentences for each extracted summary of each of the 100 uh, text documents, which I gathered. So now that we have uh, the extracted summary, it's time to perform the abstractive summarization. So abstractive summarization was performed on the concatenated abstract, extractive summary, and conclusion. And the reason I, I did this was because um, in in scientific papers, the most concise information uh, is contained in the abstract and conclusion part. So I thought that it would be uh, very important to include them. And after reading more in my reference paper, they actually used a, a similar method. So I thought that the idea was a valid thing to apply. And hence, uh, instead of just abs uh, abstracting the extracted summary, I first concatenated the abstract, extracted summary, and conclusion, and then I perform the abstracted summarization. And for this, I use a hugging face um, BART large CNN, which was trained on um, news articles. So the reason for this is because I couldn't find a pre-trained model of BART, like Cybert, which was trained on scientific uh, text. Hence, I, I used um, uh, the best mo model I could find, which was the BART large CNN. So uh, now that I have uh, the abstracted summary, it's time to deploy the model. And for that, uh, like Rikika, uh, I use Streamlit. And this Streamlit contains a text input area where, uh, excuse me, I can place uh, the text, the abstract, and the conclusion. And it contains a summary button, which when triggered, uh, performs model summary and returns the summarized version of the text. And uh, I, was trying, I was trying to run it locally, but I was having problems with my uh, resources. Uh, for some reason, uh, my device got really slow when I was just running it locally. So I decided to try and run it using um, Google Colab's CGPU. So I hosted it via a local tunnel after doing some research in order to use the um, Google Colab's CGPU and also expose the interface to the web. Uh, the main problem right now is that it's a very slow inference time, which averages at about uh, three minutes which I, I, I hope I can show in a few minutes. So this is uh, what the model looks like. It has three different text inputs. The first one asks for the long scientific text. The second one asks for the abstract. And the third one asks for the conclusion. And finally, we have a summarize button, which when uh, triggered, uh, asks the model to perform the summarization. And here is what the um, output uh, looks like on one sample. Um, document. It's uh, roughly around, uh, uh, I set the limit to 250 
to 750 words. 250 because um, that's the usual length for most abstracts. And uh, 750 as a hard um, upper limit for this. So I hope that uh, I can show it. So let me just uh, go here. Can you guys see the Jupyter Notebook? So this is the notebook I've been using for this capstone project. Yeah, we can see that. Okay, and this code will um, run the Streamlit uh, app and create a link for us um, via local tunnel. So I hope it works because sometimes it acts up. So it's running right now and we can see that it creates a uh, link for us to go to. So once we click uh, continue, it will take us to the Streamlit uh, app, which I showed uh, just a minute ago. And it will take some time, uh, but hopefully uh, we can show it here. So what this is doing now is it's generating uh, the Streamlit um, uh, app and it's uh, hosting it uh, through the net by uh, a local tunnel. So now we have this one, this three text box. And in this CSV file, I have um, my top 100 clean documents, so as you can see here. Um, I'll just take um, the first one. So first we put in the long scientific text. Then we put in the abstract. And then we put in the conclusion. And then uh, once we click summarize, it's telling us that it's running get summary. And this will uh, take a while, probably um, three to five minutes. And while that's running, I hope it will finish. Once I finish the presentation, I'll first continue on with um, some of the recommendations I have for uh, this project. So um, the first recommendation I have is that um, if there are more computational resources, I think it would be good to use co-reference handlers. So co-reference is basically a uh, uh, means um, things that refer to the same thing. So it's kind of like uh, Gerson has a dog, period. He trains it every day. So Gerson and he refer to the same thing, but um, the model doesn't know that if uh, we don't do any uh, method to handle it. So I think it would be nice, especially in long articles where um, pronouns can be used to denote um, proper nouns you know, and things like that. But this one, from my experience uh, doing this project, it actually takes a lot of GPU resources. So I, I wasn't able to apply it in the uh, capstone project. The second recommendation I have is, I think we can fine tune the summarizer with BART by um, training it on a data set consisting of the other papers in the SISAM corpus, each with its own uh, human-generated summary. What this will do is that it will uh, update the weight so that the performance of the abstracted summarizer um, matches with the um, size of data set. And the third recommendation I have is to check out uh, other transformer models because uh, there's a lot. Um, there's definitely more to it than BERT and BART. And maybe these models can be a better fit for this data set. And finally, is the last recommendation I have is to research about methods to decrease inference time on the deployed streamlit model. Because what's happening right now is that um, once we click summarize, it, it loads the pre-trained weight, and this takes time. So uh, I was thinking maybe um, if it's possible, we could put the weights maybe in a database, and instead of, in, instead of downloading it, uh, we can actually just um, take it from that database. So that would save us time, or other methods that would decrease the inference time on the deployed student model. And for some or relevant links, here are the relevant links that I used for this project. So this is the reference paper. And these are where I got the um, pre-trained transformer models. So from Hugging Face and from GitHub, this is the link to my uh, Sysum dataset from uh, Yale. And here are just the most important links uh, I use to get an idea of what, exact, what exactly is text summarization and how can it be um, utilized and applied. So let's check back on the model. I hope it summarizes, there we go. So now that we see that it took probably about three minutes as expected, and now we have uh, a summarized version of the long scientific text that we got from this top clean data set. And yes, so after that, uh, thank you very much for um, listening to the presentation. Uh, 
I hope you learned something and I hope you have a nice day. Thank you very much. All right, anyone, if you have any questions, you can ask from Jason or if, if you, you don't have any question, then I'll uh, call Juber to share his thoughts and what, what's way forward after this course. Yeah, hello everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Rudrudev who founded Omdena and Iram who actually came up with the idea of Omdena School. So because of Omdena School, instructors like me, we are able to offer courses to a worldwide audience. There's a huge opportunity for me because I'm working in industry and I can teach as an adjunct faculty at some university, I have the opportunity, but still, you get a limited number of students and your impact is very low. But when you can offer a course that reaches everywhere in the world and students are attracted to that, they come and learn, there's a huge opportunity to make a huge impact. So thanks to the students for bearing with me for this long, say six weeks course. I see most of the Omdena courses are like one week, two week, some are short. But my course is a little longer because I would like to give you a solid foundation. But the thing is, most of the time, I myself don't get the, I mean, enough opportunity to prepare myself. But I'm lucky that I had very nice and intelligent students who really made good projects. And these capstone projects are really nice. So now the question is actually where you go from here. So working in the industry, and actually I have like kind of 12 years experience working in the industry in different domains, mainly solving engineering problems, data science problems. So the first thing I would say that focus on your programming skill. I mean, NLP, computer vision, deep learning, whatever you are learning or doing, when you actually get into the real world data science, you will see that the first and foremost important skill that you will need is programming skill. So if you have not taken any course on data structure and algorithm, please take one. I think, I'm not sure if Omdena School is offering any course on data structure algorithm, but uh, my favorite is like UDCT data structure algorithm with Python. I mean, you can get a lot other in Coursera, but most of them are Java based. And nowadays I see a few data scientists are taking Java based courses. So if you are, I mean, familiar with Java, interested in Java, especially if you're doing software engineering, then you can go for the Coursera courses, especially like the Princeton University algorithm and data structure course. But if you are a Python fan and working with Python, the best would be UDCT's data structure and algorithm with Python, this course is a nano degree. Of course it's paid, so I'm not promoting them, but that's what I found useful. If you like, you can take it, you can apply for their scholarship. And the second thing is, so once you are good at programming, the second thing that you will see that is important is your software engineering skill. A lot of people, they think, okay, software engineering is something different than data science. They never pay attention to software engineering. But in real world, you'll see that most of the data science solution you have to actually put into your software. I mean, it's not just you do some offline study, come up with a report. No one is, I mean, appreciating those sort of solutions nowadays. So you have to actually productionize it. And for productionizing, you have to put it into a website, into a smartphone application somewhere. So actually it's like a software engineering problem at the end. Of course, you are not doing the same task that a typical software engineer do, but still you have to have a good understanding of how is, I mean, software is built and not really just like build anything, but the principles and the rules and you build something efficiently. So the second thing would be take any course on software engineering. I mean, know the basics of software engineering, get familiar with that. And third is like increase your NLP skill. So you have taken this course, which is aimed like de developing the foundational skills. Of course, I have not gone, I mean, into the deep level of NLP. But you can, I mean, take it further, explore some courses and I mean, like Hugging Face, they are offering NLP course on Transformers. You can take that or any other course that you find suitable. And the fourth one would be going to, 
to, I mean, develop your skill on version control and CICD. So version control, we have courses in Omdena, like how you can use GitLab and then version your code, make them ready for deployment. And then you can develop a deployment pipeline using Jenkins. We have MLOps course in Omdena school. I think Joseph Itopa, he's offering the course. You can take that course, you can take any other platform, learn how to do CICD, how to use Jenkins and GitLab also has a runner based CICD option. You can use that one too. But anyway, get familiar with CICD. In most of the real world setting, we are very much dependent on CICD. So that's all I would say that get familiar with programming and build a very strong skill in programming, get familiar with software engineering and enhance your skill in NLP and finally learn how to do CICD pipeline so that you can do version controlling and deploy your code on the go. So that's all. And we have many more other courses from Omdena School. You can have a look at our website. And the next stage for you will be join an Omdena project. I myself did, I think, four Omdena projects when I was a student, PhD student. And they helped me a lot. And we had the opportunity to work with world renowned organizations like UNDP, we worked with World Food Program. Uh, an I mean, organization by the United Nations. So you actually get the chance to work with those worldwide bodies and also work on projects that have a real world impact. And by this way, you learn it better. I mean, here you have done projects which are like week long projects, right? But when you join a real Omdena project, you work on a project that needs like two months of dedication. So like eight weeks long. So the depth and the breadth of the project will be much better. And also you learn other soft skills. I mean, just learning programming or doing programming is not enough. So you have to learn the soft skills too, how to make better presentation, how to communicate with your colleagues, how to appreciate them, how to correct them without hurting them, right? All these things are very important. Otherwise, in doing communication collaboration, we'll have a hard time and your teammates, your managers, uh, your bosses, they may not be happy with you. So everyone wants somebody who is not only a good programmer or engineer, but also a good human and also have the soft skills he needs or she needs. So Omnena projects, it offers both sides. It will give you the technical skills and also it will give you the soft skills that you need. So think of joining an Omdera project and hopefully you'll get benefited from that. So thank you very much again and hope to see you in future Omdena school courses. Bye everyone. Uh, sorry, Arum, I think you're muted. All right, I'm, I'm so sorry. So Gelsen, I have one question for you that is on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm, I'm just rechecking it again. So before going that, you, you do, do you have access to Omdina LinkedIn? If you can reply over there directly, I'll tag you there. Or if, if you have time, I can check it quickly now. Uh, sure, I, I actually saw the comment already, so I'll be replying. I'll, I'll be replying there. Can you reply live now as well, so that all of us would listen it, it now as well? Yes. Okay. So uh, I believe the question is: Was the generated summary much different from the original abstract? And uh, my answer to that question is. Uh, I believe it to be so, yes. The only thing I haven't done yet is I, I was not yet able to find a quantifiable metric to um, determine whether it was really different. But from a human's point of view, when I was uh, rereading uh, the abstract and I was rereading the um, abstracted uh, summary, it was uh, really um, different because it used, uh, um, it used uh, a bunch of different words as to what was contained in the uh, abstract. So I think the approach of including in the abstract with the conclusion 
and the extracted summary um, really help the model. So yes. Uh, does that answer the question, or Aaron? Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jubur, for uh, sharing amazing knowledge. So Jubur had another course that was on Smart Health that was that went also really well. Uh, this NLP course I have witnessed was totally different as we we learned normally from the internet. Mm, so it 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 went really well. In future, we'll have more courses from Jubur and other amazing instructors as well. Thanks again everyone for joining and congratulations uh, gerson and retika for amazing projects all right see see you everyone bye thank you very much thank you